Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming.、Uh, we're happy to welcome Jonathan Rose here today. So, Jonathan, Jonathan Rose works with cities and not-for-profits to plan and build affordable and mixed-income housing and cultural, health, and educational centers. Recognized for creating communities that literally heal both residents and neighborhoods, Rose is one of the nation's leading thinkers on the integration of environmental, social, and economic solutions to issues facing cities today. For his work as founder of the investment, development, and urban planning firm Jonathan Rose Companies, he has received awards from the Urban Land Institute, the American Institute of Architects, the American Planning Association, and the National Trust for Histor Historic Preservation, among many others. With Diana Calthorpe Rose, he is co-founder of the Garrison Institute and the creator of its Climate, Mind, and Behavior program. And Jonathan also just uh, uh, came out with a book called The Well-Tempered City, which he will be talking about today. And I also just learned that Jonathan, in 1979, designed the first、uh, residential building with internet access built into every unit.、Uh, so、uh, ideally, Jonathan will talk about that a little bit too. So let's all welcome Jonathan, and、uh, the mic will be、uh, over here for questions later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And、uh, can you all hear? Okay, great. And、uh, and it's.、Uh, Fantastic to be at Google. You are a high impact, high influence company, and we are a time in which we need high impact and high influence.、Um, so here we are, the day after the transformational election in the United States, and、um, uh, I'm going to actually. The book starts、uh, in the beginning of the history of civilization. I'm going to frame some of the issues that are going on in the world today, and and actually tie. A little bit of this into what happened yesterday, and,、um, and some concerns I have for the future. So, first of all, there's some mega trends going on in the world, and these trends affect、uh, everything that happens <coughs> in cities, and by the way, in companies too.、Um, uh, so, the first one is the world is rapidly globalizing. By 2050, I'm sorry, by 2080, 80% of the world's population will live in cities, and the way that is globalizing is not, you know, the Beautiful cities of the, of the past that we had,、uh, but it's big, it's brutal, it's concrete, and and、um, uh, and in in many ways it lacks character.、Uh, the world is also the population is growing by 2050. Demographers say that say the population will stabilize at 10 billion people. We have not planned for how to accommodate this population, and that population is becoming wealthier, consuming more.、Um, And so we're now seeing this trifecta of enormous globalization, high population, and the population the consumer. There's still, by the way, enormous poverty. Billions of people in poverty in the world, but the earth is running out of resources, and we have not designed an urban system that is actually in balance, that actually、uh, can deal with the stresses that are coming. At the same time, this growth is happening mostly in the developing world, and we're going to see another change. Um, this is from McKinsey. They say that in 2007,、um, uh, 1.5 billion people lived in the world's top 600 cities. That's going to grow. The GDP of the world's top 600 cities is going to double, and the middle class, so the big consumption part of the people living in the cities, will essentially double too, from 450 million to 750 million by 2025. But the location of those cities is going to change. So. For example, 190 of those cities today are in the United States, and by 2025, only 125 will be in the United States, which means that approximately 70 cities in the United States are going to fall off the global map. And in fact, since one of the themes of the Trump、uh, candidacy was that he was going to disconnect us from global trade, as we'll see, global trade is essential for being on the global map. It is essential for a thriving economy. It is essential for the exchange of ideas, and that. Um, uh, cutting down on trade agreements hastens our falling off the map and encourages those who are well connected to stay on. This is an issue, by the way, that London is facing post Brexit too. At the same time, the climate is changing. The climate change is caused by human activity, and、uh, that's another issue that、uh, Trump has challenged. I hope that was just a campaign slogan. It's something he will rethink. This is、uh, Tiananmen Square in China. I find this really interesting that they have to have this. Huge screen that、uh, purports to say somewhere in China the air is actually good because the air is so incredibly bad. And I don't know if any of you have been in New Delhi recently, but.
but it's also a sickly yellow there. Um, so the rapid growth of the world and the consumption of energy to power that growth is not in balance. We are not in harmony with nature. Uh, we're seeing that in all kinds of weather incidents. Um, another aspect of climate change, by the way, is it, it means that climate is changing. It's not, although the overall temperature is getting hotter, it'll be colder in some places. Uh, we are running out of water in many places. Um, and not only do we have climate volatility, we also have financial volatility. This was the, um, uh, the financial collapse of uh, 2008. One of the reasons why is the world is this incredibly complex system. And in complex systems versus linear systems, an input has a uh, unpredictable output. So for example, when Greece decided the claim that it was going to default on 50% of its bonds, about $150 billion worth of bonds, the global stock market went down by about $2 trillion. So more than 10 times. Uh, uh, so you see the, the input-output relationships in complex systems are not linear. So, and this is something that we're very vulnerable to. Um, there is also rising income inequality, which is an enormous... Uh, problem that uh, I believe was part of the drive behind uh, the dissatisfaction that led to the Trump election. But, um, uh, but we do not have a plan. This happens to be Sao Paulo, but we in the United States and the rest of the world did not have a plan for how to deal with this income inequality. As a result, this is London in 2011. There was a riot. Uh, um, it was the seething of great frustration. This is a Google map, actually, all the little dots show where um, the rise took place. In this map, the deeper the red, the, lower the, the uh, higher the level of poverty. And what's interesting is you can look at the poorest areas of London, and you don't see the deepest red, and there was no rise there. The rise took place on the edge between the lower middle class and the middle class, where largely second-generation immigrant populations felt they were facing an invisible line in the structure of society and in the structure of the economics that they could not move over, that they were trapped beyond this economic barrier, and the riots were a sense of frustration. And I believe those economic lines, which exist throughout cities of the world and societies of the world, are extreme uh, fault lines of danger. Um, you know, I can say one more thing about this. Uh, in London, as you go east, every two tube stops, uh, life expectancy goes down a year. So we live in a society that is incredibly geographically differentiated. In the United States, from the best zip code to the worst zip code, there's 20, 20 years difference in life. We know that there are enormous educational outcomes in differences in zip codes. This happens to be a county map, and it shows the likelihood that a child, when they're 26 years old, will earn more or less than their parents. And what you can see is that, again, th this is just one of the many indicators of opportunity in the United States. I believe that the promise of the United States is that we are a land of opportunity. That, land, that opportunity has been very poorly distributed. Throughout our history, we have actually improved our, we've made step by step to try and improve that access to opportunity. And, um, but today it is, poorly distributed, and you can tell that by the, the unequal distribution of our schools, the unequal distributions of mass transit, the unequal distribution of health care, and the unequal distribution of outcomes such as this. My dream, actually, is that we become a nation in which every child literally has equal opportunity. And a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is the idea of a well-tempered city is how to do that and how to accomplish that in balance with nature. The last thing is that there are currently 60 million refugees around the world, and that number is rapidly rising. Um, this happens to be in Syria. It is a uh, disaster that I think we are all in many ways responsible for because we all allowed it to happen. We didn't step up to, to stop it. But um, these people are trapped. They are trapped in a country that is literally falling apart and being destroyed. And uh, they are trapped as they escape into refugee camps. They're being trapped by anti-immigrant policies that allow the, that are creating barriers for them to move to places where they could resettle their families and restart their lives. And this, to me, is one of the great moral challenges, as well as just purely practical humanistic challenges that we face 
in the, in the 21st century. So to address all these, I decided I should really go back to the roots of cities and really understand where do they come from and what was in their very founding principles. This is a, uh, an excavation of what we did, the oldest known building. It's called uh, uh, Gobekli Tepe. It is in the southern Turkish mountains. It's an amazing place. It's actually bigger than uh, the Stonehenge. It has these, these huge rocks weighing 10, 20 tons. They were carved with these incredible uh, you know, half human, half beast figures, an amazing mythology. Now, at the same time, we don't even have records of there being huts. We don't have even records of there being uh, thatched things that people lived in. So here they were, they were pure hunter-gatherer nomads. They may have lived in mud huts or something that disappeared, but almost no other technology. And there could be other buildings. We have not excavated the whole world, and I hope we don't excavate the whole world. But anyway, um, and yet this incredible place was created. And what was its purpose? Its purpose was it was in a, it was viewed this was viewed as a sacred spot, which was where humans and nature, the man and universe, aligned. And the alignment they said was that this is the place from which the grains that were going to feed the future civilization came from. Now, interestingly, the grains that we then know that that, that became the founder crops of agriculture actually didn't emerge for a couple thousand more years. And by the way, irrigation in real agriculture uh, didn't emerge for, real irrigation didn't emerge for another five or 6,000 years, but those, those grains emerged a couple thousand years later. And when the biologists trace the DNA back, they trace it to within 20 miles of this spot. So these were pretty amazing people that had figured something extraordinary out and then created a symbol of it. There is a uh, archeologist named Klaus Schultz who says, First came the temple, then came the city. In every ancient city, when we excavate it, we find a temple underneath it. Uh, and this goes on for thousands and thousands of years of urban history and all over the world. So we understand that one of the founding principles, one of the reasons we created cities was to harmonize humans and nature. They were viewed as inflection points. The priests, that, the response of the priests were harmony was harmony when we look into the Chinese civilization, the responsibility of the early priests and then emperor was uh, absolutely clear to be the harmony between heaven and earth. Um, cities began, towns began to grow about, the first one was 9,000 BC, it was uh, the oldest one we know is Jericho, then 8, 7,000, 6,000 BC. And as they began to grow, they began to differentiate and as they differentiated, they began to interconnect. There's no point in trading with somebody if they have exactly the same things as you do. So trade came out of differentiation, and they formed what's called an interaction zone, uh, trading gold and silver and lapis and copper and alabaster, and by the way, also interesting pots and things like that, um, across about a 1,500-mile zone. And it was this mutual codependence of the towns trading with each other, trading ideas, trading goods, that allowed them all to evolve to the next level of what then became called proto-cities and began to develop the very early roots of writing and, and uh, accounting systems um, uh, and slightly more sophisticated building. That all happened not in one place. The ecology is not an independent activity. It is an interdependent activity. Um, and this is the reason why, by the way, that those nations that decide to disconnect from trade as the UK may have and the United States may have uh, fail or they, they decline because prosperity comes from these trade networks. This is actually an image of what archaeologists reconstructed of Uruk, which is the world's first city. Um, so they were uh, two, uh, three, approximately three stories tall, but tall stories. And they were magnificent places with palaces and, um, and gardens and a lot of administration and temples. And, uh, and by, this happened around 3200 BC. And by 2200 BC, we actually believe that in the Middle East, 90% of the world's population lived in cities. They were enormous attractors. And they had, at this point, they were reading, leaving, they had arrived to a level of complexity where um, the mythology was they had to balance two things. The, monster on the left is called the chaos monster, and on the right is the sun god. And so it was the kind of the, the rule of moral order against the, the, uh, the balance of chaos. And in fact, that's something that persists in our cities today. In 1752, there were BC, there was this great king, uh, Hammurabi, 
and he was the king of Babylonia, and he kind of unified a large territory with many cultures in it. And as part of that effort, he created a code, the first written code that we know of for a large region. And I'm going to read to you a little bit from the code. So it says that he, his reason for ruling was to bring about the well-being of the oppressed. The great gods have called me. I am the salvation-bearing shepherd. A good shadow is spread over my city. Uh, and I, um, I rule so that the strong may not injure the weak in order to protect the widows and orphans, in order to bespeak justice in the land, to settle disputes, to heal all injuries, to further the well-being of mankind. It's fantastic that a great and powerful ruler said, my job is so that the strong shall not injure the weak, to protect the widows and orphans, to bespeak justice. Um, that is also in the very, that idea of justice is in the very core of our cities. Um, so we have this balancing of human natures and this creation of justice. And again, those are principles that I think as we urbanize, the world urbanizes and we move forward, must be at the very DNA of what we're doing. Um, the uh, more recent history of urbanization in uh, the United States has not gone well. This is the 1970s. We built these large blocks of housing. This happens to be Pruitt Igo uh, in uh, St. Louis. It was uh, torn down um, uh, a few years after it was built. Uh, by the way, interestingly, the architect of this was the same guy who was the architect of the World Trade Center. All of his great buildings actually ended up being demolished. So as I thought about all these things, and I was wondering, um, how do we integrate them? Uh, in conversation with my wonderful editor, Karen Minaldi, I, I took, an early, in an early draft of the book, I had this theme of temperament and the well-tempered city, uh, and that became the organizing theme for the book. Um, so a history of that. In, and this was, uh, uh, it came from an amazing piece of music that Bach wrote called The Well-Tempered Clavier. It comes in two versions, book one, in book two, you should listen to it. Bach had an amazing aspiration, and that was to take what he viewed as the architecture of the universe, the harmony of all creation, and to bring it to earth and to actually transpose it, transmit it uh, through music. Um, so uh, his goal was actually to align human creativity with the creativity of life itself. Um, but he didn't have the tools to do that. And the reason was, about 2,500 years ago, Pythagoras, uh, observed that the distance between the notes on a lyre were the exact same as the distance between the planets uh, in uh, the galaxy, in, in the planetary system. By the way, a pretty good observation. Uh, you know, if we think about 2,500 years ago, that's pretty good math that he did. And he therefore said, this is the proportion, this is the order of the universe, this is the way things all should be, and everything should be tuned this way. He was kind of correct in that this proportion actually exists throughout a lot of nature, but he was not completely correct because it does not exist entirely throughout nature. But what happens is when you tune musical instruments in this perfection, they sound great in themselves, but they're slightly off with if you tune another key, another instrument or another key, and so you can never go from scale to scale or key to key. Um, so it was very constricting. The perfection was constricting. Um, about uh, in the late 15, uh, 1600s, a Chinese mathematician actually figured out how to solve this problem by tuning the keys in between per perfection, but good enough, and it allowed all of a sudden you to, to move between them. I actually view this as a, and then that system moved, that tuning system moved to Europe across the Silk Route and uh, came to Bach. And it was called uh, well temperament. And I actually view that as an operating system. And it was an operating system that dramatically increased interoperability. Um, at the same time, there was a new technology called the clavier, which is a forerunner to the piano. And so Bach had in his hands a new technology and a new operating system. And what he came out with was this incredible piece of music. And this is, by the way, in his own hand. You, know, just, you can see the kind of sweep and flow uh, that goes through the music. And the, it strikes me that we need this today. We actually need this capacity to interconnect our systems um, uh, and, uh, and combine that with new technology. And actually, there's a lot of work that Google is doing that is, um, is critical to this. And here's the reason why. So in 1970, the United States passes an environmental law called NEPA. It's the basic basis of all environmental law in the United States. 
And the purpose was to create and maintain the conditions under which man and nature can exist in productive harmony and fulfill the social, economic, and other requirements of present and future generations. That idea that we would create a land, a rule to maintain the conditions in which man and nature can exist in productive harmony, it's a fantastic idea. And it's has completely failed. It's, you know, ever since NEPA was passed, the uh, environmental conditions in the United States in general have gotten worse. And one of the reasons why is because NEPA was designed by environmental lawyers with pretty much of a sole purpose to allow people to sue to stop things. We actually need to build things, not just to stop things. And it does that by creating these individual chapters. That I won't go to all, a lot of complex engineering stuff that happens in these chapters that actually is pretty meaningless. Uh, so when one wants to develop a project, you spend millions of dollars on this analysis that, uh, that uh, provides for the potential to really be a lawsuit. Um, and we've lost the video screen. Mm -hmm. um, that provides for the potential for there to be a lawsuit, but actually does not uh, generate meaningful planning. So I actually propose we need something that's a very static system. We need to move to a dynamic system. Number one, uh, as a society, we need large-scale visions. We do not have visions. This election, as you just saw, is really devoid of vision. The United States and the world have enormous problems ahead, and I don't know anybody who has actually described solutions that rise to the scale of the affordable housing issue, the income inequality issue, the, the climate change issue, et cetera. We need visions. That needs to be turned into plans. We then need, and I'll describe these, what are called community health indicators. There are ways we can measure our progress. And then use the tools of government to regulate and in, invest and incent uh, in real time. Um, measure our outcomes, compare to the indicators, and keep that circle going. We, in essence, we need to move to a very dynamic system that is always moving us progressively further and further towards um, our vision. Okay, so we've got to move to dynamic systems. We've got a dynamic system going. They need to be community-based in terms of the planning process. So here's an example of a vision. Um, this was done by the Portland Sustainability Institute, a, a community-based process. And this, so there's a whole document behind this, but this image, so if you look in the background, there are what for Portland are denser, taller buildings. They have wind on the roof and solar on the side, so they're communicating they want to be green buildings. They want to have multiple means of transportation, so you see people in the street walking, biking, bus, a green car, and a street car. They want uh, this density to be accompanied by parks and open space, so there's a park to the left. They want it tied into regional fresh food and farming, so you see somebody selling uh, food from the local area. They want it to be a kid-friendly environment, so you see this happy little child. They have, in this image, said, Here's a view of who we wanted to be as Portland, and, and, and they've actually made a lot of steps to getting there. Um, having such an image to communicate, and something, it, you know, our cities are very, very complicated. You can't get everything into an image like this, but it's a really important step. And then I mentioned community health indicators. So these are the community health indicators of um, Santa Monica, which happens to be one of the cities that's most advanced in this. And in this, I'm just going to go through some of these things. So these are measurements of, for example, cost of living, jobs, housing balance, traffic congestion, affordability of housing, production of green housing, water use, energy use, green construction, um, residential hazardous waste, open space, parks and open space, participation in civic affairs, voter participation in off-year elections, uh, uh, economic opportunity, residence perception and safety, student drug abuse, student safety at school, advanced placement courses of students uh, achieving a passing grade. The great thing about this indicator process is there's no limit. It's not like you run out of space. So it's not like it's my indicator versus your indicator. You can gather communities together and get every indicator of issues of concern. And then we can begin to map, because we have so much big data that's coming from so many sources, we can then actually map how well are we doing against our indicators. And we can try all kinds of experiments, again, using investments in infrastructure, uh, new operating systems, investments in different school curriculums, and uh, the development of more affordable housing. You can try a whole series of programs and see, in real time, are you getting closer or farther away from your, the, the measurements of your indicators? 
You can also, this is a program called Urban Footprint, you can do scenario planning. You don't have to do it, you don't have to make mistakes. You can actually now, um, we have enough data that we can actually project a range of strategies, run them through scenario plans and see what the outcomes are and measure them. The next thing we have to do is we have to move to a circular economy. 98% of the things that enter a city on day one leave within six months later as waste. Um, we can, a 10 billion population, we cannot afford to do that. We have to recycle. And so we can do things like taking storm water and clean it up and recycle it back and make drink water. We can take our organic waste, as they do in San Francisco, they take all organic waste and it's separated. It is composted in job providing co-ops and then uh, brought uh, used to uh, fertilize farms in Napa Valley. The point about this is we move to a circular economy. We actually become less vulnerable to global fluctuations in resources. We become more energy and locally efficient, sufficient, self-sufficient, and we create a lot of local jobs. This is an example in the 1980s. This is the water treatment plant, the sewage treatment plant in Windhoek, which is the capital of Namibia. Namibia is rapidly growing. It's a desert city. The desert was growing, and people were running out of water. They took their sewer water, they cleaned it to perfection, and turned it into their drinking water. The engineer who designed this said, um, you should judge water by its quality and not by its history. And this has worked for 40 years without a single accident. And today, Windhoek is uh, tripled in size and is a thriving city uh, because it's recycling its water. There's a, a water uh, treatment plant actually outside of Washington, D.C. that not only is recycling uh, its water, it is removing the nitrogen and phosphorus in the water for $100 a ton and selling it to fertilizer manufacturers for $400 a ton. And so it's become a factory. It is capturing all its methane and not only burning that to power the plant, but also to uh, power several thousand homes in the nearby neighborhood. So it's an energy plant, it's a factory, it's all of a sudden become a positive contributor to the economy. If we think about every aspect of our systems and we turn them, uh, as we rebuild our infrastructure, into these circular systems, they'll have enormous environmental and resilience benefits. At the same time, we need to build much greener buildings. This is a project we build in the South Bronx called Via Verde um, that begin to capture their own rainwater, capture their own sunlight. You'll see solar on the south side of this building, grow their own food. It's not only this garden here, there's uh, uh, apple and pear orchards below. This is where we capture their rainwater. This is some of the solar. And now imagine, uh, this is a building called the Bullet Building in, San, in uh, Seattle, which is, generates in that big hat more solar than it consumes. It captures more rainwater than it consumes. Its water goes through the building. The sewage is actually treated in the basement totally cleaned up, the uh, biosolids are then digested or turned into fertilizer for gardens in the building. It's a completely self-sustaining ecosystem. Not completely, but pretty much. But imagine now, if we have these green buildings and we start connecting them into microgrids, and these are microgrids of, that are cycling in water between buildings and energy between buildings and heat between buildings and information between buildings, and they're tied into multiple sources of power. As I mentioned, it could be solar, it could be batteries, it could be you know, from uh, autonomous vehicles, charging and, and discharging, it can be cogeneration systems. And all of a sudden what you get is you get a network with distributed energy instead of one big power plant that when it goes out, it goes out. You have multiple sources and you have multiple pathways and what you create is called what's called a self-healing network. Much more flexible, much more adaptable. Uh, much, by the way, when we produce power in a power plant, by the time the plant itself is, uh, is energy inefficient, the conversion of burning something into fuel, and then it goes through the has transmission losses and line losses, and by the time it gets to us, we're only using about a, the third of the BTUs that were actually generated, burned at the plant. When you do this, you're using uh, typically two-thirds of the energy, so much, much, much more efficient, much less pollution related to this, and as I said, much more resilient um, uh, so, but you have to think now this is about a systems change. Remember the whole point about temperament is it took things that were independent and began to weave them together. So this is all now be about thinking that our energy systems, our building systems, um, our infrastructure, all these things are woven into patterns. We also need to weave nature through this. We need to create greener streets. Uh, in Philadelphia, the city um, 
had a stormwater problem, and its stormwater system was creating terrible pollution. The federal government, uh, EPA, put out a court or an order that said they had to separate their storm and their wastewater systems would have cost them $8 billion. They came back and said, what if we build green streets like this? What if we uh, green every schoolyard? What if we ha create uh, economic incentives for developers to do green roofs? And we spend a billion dollars creating new parks. Um, we could absorb so much stormwater that we wouldn't have to spend the $8 billion. And the EPA said yes, and they are saving $7 billion at the same time, making a much more beautiful, greener, more pleasant city. And when you plant a tree, it not only um, absorbs the stormwater, but um, it has all these other co-benefits. For example, uh, uh, a neighborhood full of trees is six degrees cooler in the summer. A neighborhood full of trees has much less air pollution because it absorbs air pollution. Trees actually absorb carbon dioxide. They're a carbon sink. Um, they increase home values, which is good for the homeowner, but when the values go up, real estate taxes go up, which is good for the city. All that comes from just planting trees. We can then begin to tie, this is Singapore, we can begin to tie these into whole networks of neighborhoods, into uh, neighborhoods that are infused with biodiversity. Um, we can, this is a, a plan called the Big U for Lower Manhattan, how to deal with rising sea level. We now know that one of the best solutions, at least interim <coughs> solutions, is to green all of our waterfronts with beautiful parks and gardens, um, which not only makes them more resilient, gets buildings out of harm's way, these are areas that kind of flood, are designed to flood occasionally, um, but they create enormous human value. They, hu they, as our cities become denser, if we also make them greener at the same time, that makes them more pleasant places to live. All right, we have social issues we have to deal with too. Um, the solution is something called developing communities of opportunity. And we now know, remember I started this talk by saying our responsibility, I believe, is to create landscapes of opportunity for all. And we now know what the constituents of those are. It has to start with a base of affordable housing, of safe, green, affordable housing. I'll explain more about that in a minute. We need great education systems. In Finland, every school is of equal quality, whether you live in the best neighborhood or the worst neighborhood, the most Finnish neighborhood or the most immigrant neighborhood. We do not have that in America. We need a great distributed healthcare system. Uh, we need parks and open space, neighborhood serving markets with fresh and nutritious food, arts and culture, multiple means of mass transit, livelihood, which is jobs. And I re deeply believe we need centers of spirituality. And we need those because um, we need to find, ultimately to deliver all this, we need greater compassion. And I don't know how many of you uh, participate in Search Inside Yourself. It's a great Google program I highly recommend. So again, we can map these issues, we can actually see how well we are doing or not doing these elements of opportunity. Uh, and we can begin to address them. This is actually a project we built in New York City on uh, New York City Housing Authority land uh, that has an incredible uh, uh, charter school in the lower floor, uh, beautiful, uh, connected to, to open space and, and nature, and then affordable housing above after school program. When, Louis, when New Orleans uh, was built after Hurricane Katrina, one of the things is, Whole Foods came into one of the poorest neighborhoods and trained uh, young people for, for local jobs and the serving of fresh foods, which is so essential also for uh, mental development. Social networks are also really important. In 1997, there was a great heat wave in Chicago and over 700 people died. A, um, a sociologist named Eric Kleinenberg uh, did a study of where people died. And what he discovered was that um, the death rates were lowest in the wealthy white neighborhoods and the highest in the poor black neighborhoods. But there were two poor black neighborhoods that actually outperformed the white neighborhoods. And the reason was they had amazing social networks. They had communities of compassion and care built around their churches in which they visited the elderly every single day. They made sure that they were fed. In the case of um, heat waves, they made sure that they were had uh, fans and that they were um, uh, drinking enough water, etc. And that community of care is what improved uh, the health outcomes. We now know that is absolutely critical for part of the resilience of our cities. There's also a horrendous disease that is attacking human resilience. It's called adverse childhood experiences. About 20% of our population has it and it's growing. When a child is, experiences uh, abuse, you know, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, 
family dysfunctions such as domestic violence and neglect, physical or emotional. Each one of those things is called an adverse childhood experience. So the child, by the time they're four, experiences four or more. We now know through huge population studies that they'll have the following extremely negative life outcomes. They will have more than twice as much likelihood of arthritis, of cancer, of diabetes, heart attack, heart disease, stroke, etc. These are just the physical issues. There's also a series of mental issues because what happens is the child gets put in the flight fight mode. And, uh, and out of fear, they have no idea where the next attack is coming. Their brain is wired to continuously look for it. So we're in their school, they can't pay attention. That's where ADD, one of the causes of ADD, they're always looking around. They can't form friendships. Remember, we just saw how important social relationships are for community resilience. They can't form friendships because they're afraid of human threats. Um, when they hit puberty, they switch into the fight mode high, and engage in very high risk behavior. You see very high teenage pregnancy, joining gangs. Um, all of this is preventable. We know a huge amount of it is caused by these adverse childhood experiences. Um, it's a hidden disease. We know that if you have six or more uh, what are called ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, your life expectancy is going to be 20 years less. We know that for today, we can now predict that for all the four-year-olds today, it will cost society $124 billion in health and social care costs throughout their life. And next year, the next level four-year-old, $124 billion, on and on and on, until we commit as a society to cure this. We know that there are cures. By the way, ACEs happens fairly instantaneously, but it takes a long, long time to cure. But we know that uh, a um, traumatic experience doesn't get hardwired in the brain for uh, about 90 days. That meditation is a very is one of the ways to mediate it, and because trauma is embodied, that yoga is another thing. These are not sufficient on their own. They need to be combined with family therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, training people who have been traumatized how to build social networks, building relationships with trust. I visited a fantastic program. Um, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky on my book tour called the Compassionate Schools Program that takes some elements that were created at a not-for-profit that my wife and I created called the Garrison Institute, um, uh, training teachers in these techniques um, uh, along with other elements. And so you have a whole class. And actually, their goal is to have, they're looking for funding to have the whole school system all learning what they're called in this Compassionate Schools Program. They're actually dedicated Louisville is committed to be a compassionate city. But it's, the, the uh, relations in the school is entirely different because when a kid acts out, the teachers actually understand the source of why they're acting out. And the solutions, instead of punishing the kids, they give the kids are entirely different solutions. Um, as I said, this requires also teacher training. Where's the money going to come from for this? The United States spends more than, these are all the OECD nations, the most developed nations. We, we're on the left of this chart. We spend almost twice as much as all the other OECD nations on health care, and that cost is rising rapidly. The other nations, so we're, now we're, the health care expenditure is the blue part of this chart. It's a little hard to see. And the red part is what the other nations spend on social services, on prenatal care, on family leave, on um, affordable housing, on uh, uh, early childhood education. And if you look at it, they're spending half of what we're spending on health care, twice as much as we're spending on all these other things. And the average is they're more or less spending the same as we are. They're just spending the dollars differently. They're getting much, much better social outcomes and much, much better educational outcomes. And they're saving half the health care dollars. So the way we have constructed our system of, uh, of expenditure for social support in the United States is out of kilter with what we really know to be best practice. Um, to end, um, I have several times mentioned that we need to be a more compassionate society to address all of these. We know the answer. The point is we actually technically know the answers to our environmental issues, to our infrastructure issues, to our social justice issues. We know how to create a more equal society. We know how to create a society in balance with humans and nature. We need the will to make it so. And the will to make it so needs to come from a different mindset. Einstein said that you cannot um, solve a problem with the state of mind that created the mindset. 
the roots of the solutions are actually lying in every one of our religions. And I'm just going to read you one paragraph um, uh, from the book. Uh, we need to actually entwine this deep sense of compassion and understanding of systems theory, how everything is interconnected. And I call that entwinement. And this entwinement with the motivation to actually heal the world's problems or our city's problems lies at the core of all the world's major religious traditions. In Buddhism, the combination of pervasive altruism and the recognition of interdependence is called bodhicitta. In Islam, the mix of interdependence and altruism is called tuan, and itar is the peak of altruism. In Judaism, tikkun olam is the recognition that we have a responsibility to repair any tears in the fabric of the world with acts of goodness or mitzvah. The Hindu leader Mahatma Gandhi taught satyagraha, the power of nonviolent action towards truth and social justice. And Pope Francis's encyclical letter, Laudato Si, calls for an integral ecology, creating a universal community that excludes no one or no thing. These are within our culture. These are within the roots of our civilizations. And they are buried today. And we need to bring them forth. As I said, I think we actually need the symbols of spirituality, the places that were at the very roots of our early civilizations to bring us back to the wholeness that we must create in the world. There is a, I'm going to end with a quote from a, um, a great architect, uh, Christopher Alexander, in his book, The Timeless Way of Being, in which he said, making wholeness heals the maker. When we act to create more wholeness in our communities, in our cities, on earth, that actually heals us. And that is what I wish for all of us. Thank you. So for everyone, the mic is here if you have any questions. I'd actually like to start with one question. Yeah. If, there's, uh, if there's anything that you would recommend for, for folks in New York, if right. we wanted to sort of um, live some of what you're describing, uh, what, what would we do? What should we do? Ah, OK, great question. So uh, there's, there are many things you can do. So the first is uh, to learn. There, you can buy my book, and there are many other wonderful books. By the way, another book I would highly recommend is called Dying and Living in the Neighborhood by Prabhjot Singh, who's a doctor who writes about, um, uh, in Mount Sinai, and he writes about um, uh, neighborhood-based health care systems. We need to look at so. Read, learn, you know, learn the issues. The second one is to show up, to become part of community organizations, to volunteer. So your community board is the voice within your city for actually how a lot of policy gets set. I started my work working in the, in the Lower East Side. I lived and worked in the Lower East Side in the 1970s, back when Lower East Side was a, a very, very different place, very dangerous, uh, heroin-filled, violent place. Um, with a community group called the Education Alliance, um, uh, building early homeless centers and drug treatment centers and, and the fabric of, uh, um, uh, of repairing that community. There are after-school tutoring programs. There's so that, I, that amazing school that I showed you in Harlem started out as an after-school tutoring program uh, where a bunch of lawyers and hedge fund guys built a ballpark in Harlem on an empty lot for some kids and then we're just playing baseball with them and got to know them and then learned they realized they needed um, uh, educational support and started doing tutoring in that amazing school called Harlem RBI grew out of that. So community development work is deeply meaningful and, and uh, it can be very, very useful. On the issues of uh, understanding the nature of mind and how we can actually integrate some of our contemporary thinking about uh, the transformation of mind, including meditation, uh, but also um, really the latest in neuroscience, go to the Garrison Institute website, www.garrisoninstitute.org. There's a lot there. And then each in your own way, you know, weave it together in a way that works for you and your family and the time that you have available. But I actually believe that each one of us can be enormous contributors. And the last thing, this is an amazing and powerful company. And it is also giving each of you the opportunity to do some personal projects. And they're projects, even if you have not thought of one, that other people are working on that can be really transformational. Uh, this is a company that is actually thinking about what is the future of society and what is going to be your role in it. 
an amazing platform to be working with. And each one of you is a piece of the DNA of that. And I really, really encourage you to think about how your work with Google or Alphabet can be part of the transformation that the world needs. Hi there. Thank you for coming to speak at Google. Um, I am interested in hearing your thoughts on NIMBYism. Um, you describe a lot about community involvement. And while building green buildings in Santa Monica is great, a lot of people would say that a large source of the problems with cities is that you know Santa Monica doesn't build very much. They have relatively few people who then move to the desert, Las Vegas, San Bernardino, right? Um, and what what are your thoughts about NIMBYism and how it affects development and what we should look for in policy? Thank you. It's a fantastic question. So NIMBYism, or not in my backyard, are movements in which people resist development. The, frankly, probably the worst place in the United States is San Francisco, where um, uh, there's a huge job housing imbalance. As many of you may know, it's actually even more expensive to rent an apartment in San Francisco than in New York City. Um, our affordable housing issues can only be solved by building our way out of it. There are 20 million American families today who spend more than 50% of their income on housing. And because poverty in the United States is more suburban than urban, spend more than 20% and often 30% of their income on transportation. So they're spending 70, 80, and sometimes more percent of their income on just housing and getting to and from work. And uh, there's no room. Uh, they literally often don't eat the last week of the month or can't feed their kids. Um, we can, with a growing population and a decline in affordable housing, by the way, America loses its affordable housing stock by about 12% every decade, some to gentrification, some to uh, abandonment. We can only build our way out of this problem. Uh, we need to build beautiful, uh, you know, I believe that um, I showed Pruitt Igo and the place was torn down. That's not the way to build. There are ways to build great and beautiful green cities. I believe as we make them dense, they must be much denser. As they're denser, they have to be accompanied by more parks and open space. So we have to, we just can't densify our cities without giving something that makes them more uh, humane back. They also have to be accompanied by amazing schools and healthcare systems. We have to have a vision for that. But that vision must be built. If that vision is not built because of NIMBYism, then the fracture lines that I started with between of income inequality uh, will become untenable. And uh, we will see more rioting in the streets. And we will see the Trump election is a reflection of people feeling like they are trapped behind lines of inequality, that they, that they couldn't move forward with their lives. And all, that's going to get worse. And so as a, if we're a civilized nation, we have to commit to building a better future. And that means we have to give up the knack not in our backyard and accept that these issues are all of our yards. We have time for one last one. Yeah. What's your opinion on mixed-use zoning? I love mixed-use zoning. So here's what happens when you mix-use zone. So what happened is in the cities were always mixed, use, mixed uses. So different kinds of housing, you know, apartment buildings, uh, single family houses, townhouses, shops, offices, mixed together. In the 1920s, we began what's called Euclidean zoning. Sounds like Euclidean from geometry, but it's actually named after Euclid, Ohio, a town in which there's a famous legal case. And the, um, the result of Euclidean zoning was that America, uh, the zoning gained the legal status to set us in separate districts. And that was viewed as a social good because it meant that a bad factory, a polluting factory, couldn't be next to a bunch of homes. That is true. But what came out of it is this vast segregation. And the only way to get from one place to another place was through driving. When you mix uses, you create, what, you create much more walkable communities. So imagine if you lived near where you work, which we can do in New York City, but there are many parts of the country where you actually can't, then you can walk to live, to work, to food, to movies, to bars and bowling, and all this stuff, and parks and open space, and all the different things you want are all contained in a fantastic, close community. That only happens with mixed-use zoning. 
single use zoning segregates us. That's exactly, so the idea of temperament that I was describing, which allows us to mix musical scales, allows us to mix uses. So I thank you all for your attention, and it's a true honor to be here at Google.